ladies. Hello. Woo! I love the energy. This is wonderful. Lots of talking, lots of networking. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming. Isn't this wonderful? Right? Nothing like being in the room with other brilliant women like yourselves. So you can have a little, a little networking, a little uh, sharing, a little, little conversation. And that's the point of Upward. You all are Upward members, so you've, you've been to Upward events before. It stands for Uniting Professional Women and Accelerating Relationships and Development. I started it back in uh, the first part of last year, and we have grown from 40 to 50 people to 850 people <laughs> in one year. I mean, it's really amazing. It's just been word of mouth, and we haven't done any marketing, but somebody comes to an event, and they tell me about four or five other people that should come to the next event, and then they tell me about four or five more people that should come. And so we've got something really good going. And the purpose of this, as many of you probably know, uh, McKinsey and others have done studies that say there are reasons why women don't advance. And we're all senior women. The definition for upward is manager level and above. There are several reasons. Some of the structural reasons are a lack of informal networks or a lack of access to some of the informal networks, which are mostly boys, <laughs> and a lack of mentors and a lack of sponsors. And so what I wanted to do with Upward is create a community of like people so that you can get support, advice. I mean, we should be our own personal advisory boards to one another helping each other on job opportunities and how to negotiate the contract. And we've done some really interesting discussions on various topics and we have a number of our panelists and speakers. In fact, why don't we have those folks stand up? Just people who have spoken at an Upward event. I know Nancy's here, yes, and Becky's here. Come on, stand up. Michael is here. So we have a few of our, uh, few of our alumni here. And we have an amazing uh, panel scheduled for you today. I want to tell you, when I sent the invitations out for this, in three days, we had 100 RSVPs. <laughs> and the capacity for this is 100 people. In three days, we were sold out. So obviously, this is a topic that people are very interested in. Uh, we had to turn so many people away who wanted to come. So I was trying to get Margaret and Jean to, next time we do a much bigger venue, we can invite a lot more people. <laughs> there we go. That's right. So. Uh, we had uh, you know, tremendous interest in this. We got a great panel for you, which uh, they'll introduce themselves. They were kind enough to come. And I especially want to thank Margaret, um, who is our sponsor. Stand up for us, Margaret. Margaret Winmacher, she is the superstar PR person at Andreessen Horowitz. And you, know, you guys have probably read lots about her. She's, she's remarkable. And she's agreed to, to sponsor us and to host the events. And, you know, to moderate our panel. So we got her doing double duty today. She's going to be active. <laughs> and she's going to have some opening remarks for you. So I think I'll, I'll summarize it just to say, you know, bring your questions, right? You guys are very interested in this topic. We're going to talk about demystifying venture capital. I mean, I heard that from a lot of you. It's like, it's a black box. What exactly is it? How do you get in it? How do you excel at it? You know, how do you advance um, a career in venture capital? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about why there aren't more women. I mean, women, according to a, a number of surveys, Catalyst says 69% of the purchase decisions in America are made by women. 89% are influenced by women. And a lot of the technology, social media especially, is consumed by women. Largely. So why aren't we on the product teams and why aren't we on the venture capital firms? And we have a, a talented group of VCs here, but why aren't there more of us? So we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to open it up for questions too, so feel free to, to chime in when you're ready. But uh, just wanted to introduce myself, the group, and to thank our sponsor, Andreessen and Margaret. No thank you guys. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm thrilled because we have a panel of some of the best VCs in the business. Um, right here, and note that I'm not saying female VCs. Um, these women are some of the best VCs in the business. Um, you know, and I think Anne serves as an inspiration for many of us um, because you, you started this whole thing, uh, I think, so thank you for doing that. Um, this is a kind of let your hair down event. Uh, we wanted to be, thank you, we wanted to be 
positive and constructive, but also really honest, so it's off the record. So please um, don't tweet out the spicy stuff that gets said. Um, also, pl please don't tweet out the boring stuff, because the last thing we want to do is sound or look boring at all. Uh, not allowed. But I thought I'd start with um, thanking you for coming and making each of these women just do a rapid fire intro, and maybe you can share a little bit about like who you are and what kinds of deals you like to do. Sure. Um, I'm Ann Winblad, the co-founding partner of Hummer Winblad Venture Partners. Uh, this is our 25th year as a venture capital firm, so time flies. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, uh, we are a focus fund, uh, which means we focus on one sector. Uh, it's a very large sector now called enterprise software, and we always start with A round investments. We don't do seed, and we don't start at a later stage. So it's very easy to describe a focus fund, and that's what I do every day is focus. <laughs> okay, good. Yes. All right, Aileen, sure. um, Aileen and Teresa both just broke out on their own, so congratulations yep. on that. Um, <laughs> 25 years over here and year one or two. Year two, yeah. Year two, year two and year yeah. one over yeah. here. So why Yeah, don't exactly. You? So I'm Aileen. I'm really honored to be here. This is an awesome group, so thank you so much, you guys, for doing this. Um, I am the founder of a fund called Cowboy Ventures, and we're a seed and small A oriented fund that does kind of what we call across the board internet software. It's about 60% consumer oriented, 40% enterprise. So it's kind of a generalist seed oriented fund. Um, and before starting Cowboy, I, I, I'm, I guess, technically still a partner at Kleiner Perkins, but I spent 14 years at Kleiner Perkins. I met all of these ladies basically like my first year in 99. And so I'm really indebted to them because they've been fantastic friends and inspirations. Hi, I'm Teresa. It's really awesome to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, so uh, as Margaret was saying, so uh, I'm co-founder of a firm called Aspect Ventures, which I co-founded with Jennifer Fonstad earlier this year. I was uh, at Excel for 15 years as an investing partner there, and Jennifer was at DFJ for 17 years. Uh, and so super excited to be continuing on in venture capital, but to be a co-founder and entrepreneur <laughs> like many of you all. And our fund is, uh, we've actually, well, they haven't been all announced yet, but we've actually, we announced in February and we've closed four investments so far. <laughs> our focus, <laughs> um, our focus, not unlike Aileen and, and, uh, and Anne, Series A in seed investments uh, in um, mobile and internet software, both consumer and enterprise. Um, still TBD what the mix will be, but probably will end up somewhat like Aileen's. And um, Anne definitely uh, is the sort of the pioneer in sort of showing not only women in venture, but starting her own firm. Yep. Um, I'm a slower learner than, than Aileen, so <laughs> you know, it took Aileen 14 years, me 15 years, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> Lisa. Wonderful, wonderful. I should also announce Kate Mitchell. Kate was going to be here today. She had to go to the hospital yesterday, so she sends her regrets. She's fine. They're just taking some precautions. She was in Turkey for, uh, for several weeks, and, and doctors just being precautious. So she sends her apologies. We'll do something with her next time. So I'm Lisa Lambert. I, you know, when I'm not doing Upward, I'm doing uh, venture capital. <laughs> <laughs> I work at Intel Capital. I've uh, been at Intel for 17 years. Crazy 17 years, amazing. 14 and a half years investing. And I'm responsible, the managing director for our software and services group. So we're investing across all stages in every geo and really every software discipline. A large per percentage of our portfolio I'd say is enterprise, although we do have some consumer and uh, we do have technology enabled services that we're beginning to invest in. So Intel Capital has been in the business since 1990. We're global, we have investment professionals on every continent, we've done a deal in every continent, and uh, you know, we're continuing to go strong. We're strategic investor, so it's not just about financial, we're supposed to add value to Intel Corporation, but we do care about financial too, and we are comped on that, so we have to make money while we're doing strategic deals. They're serving two masters then. That's right. That's much tougher. So um, now that the introductions are the way, I want to make sure that this is an interactive event. So if at any point you have a question, just raise your hand or say like, hey, I want to ask something. <laughs> there are mics in the back, but if you can't wait for that, just make sure I see you and uh, raise your voice because um, this is your event. So I want to make sure you get out of it what you want to. Um, Lisa rightly said that venture capital is a bit of a black box, and I think it's also, it, it, it's been a part of a strategy of most firms to not really talk that much about what goes on in there. 
So in the spirit of demystifying it, I'm going to ask Teresa, I'm um, going to just pick on you first. Um, what do you think of venture capital? Like, what do you do all day? Like, <laughs> what are, what is it actually that happens? I know there's at some point there's a meeting with an entrepreneur, but like, <laughs> how do you get there? Um, yeah. So my, my daughter asked me that question too. And my answer to her is like, meetings, lots of meetings and phone calls. Um, we want the next level then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so what I would say is there's really, uh, if you think about it, once you're sort of up and running as a venture capitalist, your, the things that you spend your time on are split between the companies that you've already invested in and that you're usually on the board of and meeting potential new companies, new entrepreneurs and new executives that you're trying to recruit into your companies. So um, in any given day, it might be that you would have a board meeting for one of your companies, or you might have uh, an interview. You're looking for a VP of marketing for one of your companies. So you know, every day is different, but if you look in a long, long term, I think it's maybe half of your time on existing company board work, and maybe half of your time looking at new companies. And so there's this magical world were deal flow, Aileen. So, you know, how, how do you find the deals? Do they all just magically walk in the door? You know, right. th that's a huge, you know, that's the magic that you have yeah, to Yeah, I have. was going to add to Teresa's, which is like, you spend half your time meeting with new companies, half your time working with portfolio companies, half your time doing email. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you yeah, half your time it. running your firm. I mean, it's like a 24-7 job. I think that's one of the things that um, people who have maybe been entrepreneurs or operators in companies who join venture firms usually say after the first year, year like, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it was. People think right? VCs don't work. I yeah, it's, it's like, I think the myth they of thought like, we just played golf. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or the men anyway. Definitely not. I mean, it, maybe the other VCs do that. We, I don't know. <laughs> yes. One thing I'm surprised you didn't mention in your workload is you have to spend time with your limited partner study. Mm -hmm. Does that not take much time? Or? She doesn't. <laughs> Right now, I'm investing my own money, but um, it, it does take time, but it's episodic. So typically, venture firms will raise new funds every two to four years, and during that fundraising period, you're spending the other half of your 250% yeah. of your time right. with limited partners raising money. Other than that, you know, most people are on a cadence of, you know, maybe annual or biannual uh, LP updates. Right. You do an event once a year, and that usually takes care of it outside the yeah. fundraising cycles. So yeah. you were going to talk yeah. about deal flow. Oh, yeah, deal flow. Um, you know, it's definitely something that we think about a lot, right? Because like, I, when I think about my job, my job is seeing the best ventures that are started every month or every year, making the right calls on them, which is as important as seeing them. But if you don't see them, you're not going to be able to make the right call, right? And then you have to actually, like, hopefully add value to help them to get to a great outcome. You know, and then you have to think about like running your firm there and marketing your firm so that pe you're going to get to see the best deal. So that's kind of like how I spend the, my there, time. There's a thing that mm -hmm. I think you left out mm -hmm. um, that is winning the deal. Because I yes. think the good deals are competitive. That's true. That's so, uh, totally true. Uh, and yeah. what's your, like, how do you think about winning the deal? Maybe you don't have, you have less pressure after 25 years. Well, I think um, everybody has to cultivate their own unique deal flow. That's sort of part of it so that you're not out there chasing deals. And that really is what uh, separates the top venture firms from the other venture firms. Because if you have to chase deals and try to get into them, it's a lot of time uh, and you frequently don't get the deal. So I think everybody on this panel really does a good job in cultivating unique deal flow and looking ahead to some of the trends in the industry and who might you know, step out of companies. And the advantage we all have after doing it over a decade or several decades is that you know, you get to see a crop of people that you've helped recruit into these companies. And it's not always your CEOs that start the next company. It might be the VP of product management or the VP of engineering. So you can't get lazy about deal flow. Y you always have to really pay attention to it right. because the quality of your deal flow is going to determine your outcomes at the end. Uh, but I, I think that most of the deal chasing these days is the later stage, not the early stage. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either, but go ahead. Me? Anyone? All right. Uh, deal flow. So, yeah, it is, it is about cultivating the relationships. I mean, Intel Capital has an advantage in that we've got people all over the globe, not just the investment professionals, but we've got people within our divisions that are in different parts of the world, and they see, they see deal flow. We still largely source our deal flow through our network. 
Um, it's a big network, right? We've, we've closed over a thousand dollars, a thousand different investments over the past, say, five to ten years, uh, over ten billion invested in total. So we've got a huge network, and entrepreneurs tend to invest or start a new venture 12 months after they exit. And so if you cultivate those relationships, you stay in touch with those people, uh, invariably you're going to get connected to some really interesting deal flow. So we spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, one of the challenges about deal flow is all the stuff we get over the transom. Yeah. And it's a real challenge because you don't want to throw it all the way, all the way, but you cannot meet with every entrepreneur who approaches you. So, yeah. you know, the, the signal to noise ratio is, is interesting in venture capital because we're, we're running around with dollar signs on our head. And, you know, <laughs> we can't get confused. Which, uh, <laughs> which leads right into the art of saying no. Any, any good advice on how to do that? Because I'm sure you do that more than anything. Actually, I have a question though for you. How do you, on the entrepreneur side, sorry, Sharon Goldstein, uh, CMO at Pixley, on the entrepreneur side, how do you, we also can't meet with every potential VC, and yet we need to have a feedback cycle so that we make sure that we're, you know, setting ourselves up for success and finding the right VCs to provide our funding. So what, how do we decide if you're the one to reach out to or other than, okay, well, if we're going for A, let's say, and we're looking for, and we're in the enterprise space, how do you recommend people self-select to contact you and how do you decide on the other side who you reach back to? Well, those are two questions that we might have different answers to. Um, uh, you know, when our companies are out raising money and another 30% of our 300% time is actually helping our companies <laughs> raise their follow-on rounds. There, there are a lot of venture firms, and many venture firms have almost telemarketing people that are calling up these companies. And our, well, I'll go to a board meeting, and our CEO will say, "Well, someone called me from so and so," and you know, it, it does make sense for you to spend some time thinking about the lay of the land of which set of venture capitalists uh, you should approach. It also is determined a bit by who does your first round and right. who their collegial circle is that they've worked with. Because you do want like-minded investors around the table so that your own investor circle and your board meetings themselves don't turn into a circus. Um, so I would leverage your seed stage investors, your A round investors for the follow-on ones. It gets easier then. Um, and I'm surprised all the time um, that even when we give companies a term sheet, you know, I always say, hey, you should talk to our CEOs. Mm -hmm. Or even before we give you a term sheet, talk to our CEOs, um, you know, find out if we're the right investor for you because, you know, once you get us, it's hard to get rid of us <laughs> <laughs> forever. So, you know, it, it, it takes some time to do that, but it takes less time than running around talking to everyone. Now, you may have to, in the end, run around and talk to everyone if you're at the wrong point in raising money or, you know, it's sort of a challenging period to raise money, um, either on the venture side or your side. So, you know, don't lose the contacts, but spend some time on that. The second question, which is, how do we uh, deal with over the transom? I would say that every partner in our firm is different. Um, you know, I, I've feel like I was sort of a non-pedigreed entrepreneur in my early days, so I was over the transom in every way you could describe. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't call anyone and say, will you call someone for me? I was just sort of like knocking on doors. Uh, so I have, you know, kind of a sweet spot for actually looking at the over the transom stuff. And, you know, it turns out that some You're of You're going to get a lot of stuff now. <laughs> Well, it turns out that some of our best deals ever were, you know, something caught my eye or someone else's eye. It does take a bit more time, but also I, I, I once a week say, look, I've got it <coughs> five entrepreneurs that I've never heard of before, that I don't know, that might be in a different cir circle or set of people. Otherwise, I'm, I'm treading the same path over and over, which is easy, but it's not going to get great returns. The thing I'd add to the over the transom, because I think it is m probably more often um, rare that an over the transom venture bec gets funded by a traditional venture firm and then it becomes a big hit. Um, I think your best shot if you aren't being, if you don't know the people to refer you into an, a target investor is to have traction. 
Like when I think about mm -hmm. companies like Nasty Gal or Monocloth, just like they had traction, they were kind of like unknown, but they were able to write and be like, hey, I bootstrapped this on my own and I'm doing yeah. five or 10 million in revenue. Then you'll get someone's attention. But if you're, I've got this idea, I don't really know anybody, can you, then, then you're most likely to get people's attention. Yeah. The only thing I'd add on the first part about, um, you know, how do you f pick the right VC um, partner? And I'm being very specific, not just firm, but the right partner. Because as Anne says, you know, you're likely going to have this person, you know, it used to be six years. The last stuff I've seen is like right. 10 years. <laughs> so you're going to be on board with this person for 10 years. Um, so you're really, um, let's hope that, you know, you guys work well like together. It's a bunch of marriages, so. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was really yeah. last right. longer than Longer than most celebrity <laughs> ones by a long shot. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's your work, it's your work marriage. Um, so what I always tell entrepreneurs is that you should think about this as it's a two-way street. Just like, just like when you're recruiting for, for a, an employee to your company or you're interviewing for a job, which is something you guys can all, it, in actuality, it's a two-way street, right? So, yes, absolutely, I would assume that you would have, you know, done research on Lisa or Anne or Aileen, and you know some of the investments they've made, you probably therefore should talk to some of their entrepreneurs, and then it won't be an over the transom introduction because you're just doing your homework. You want to make sure, like, what is it like to work with them? Do they, are they interested in the space that I am in or the business model that I'm pursuing? Because it's also about, you know, what's the fit with their expertise, their network, their value add um, to be on your board for that. And the last thing that I would say is absolutely 150% what Ann said, and this was, I included in my half of the time with companies, it's not board meetings, right? It's all the other stuff. It's, it's recruiting people I didn't explicitly call, but absolutely, I view, I've always viewed my job as a, as an early stage venture investor is to help my companies get financed through to whatever is the best outcome for them, whether that's an IPO, which does tend to take 10 years, <laughs> having been through that a couple of times, um, or an acquisition. And you know, my job is to help you find the right partner for your Series B, C, or expansion round. And Jen and I were counting it up when we launched our firm. I mean, between the two of us, we probably helped our companies raise over 350 rounds of follow-on venture capital. That's the kind of stuff that you should be wanting from your investment partner. So ask the right questions. And then, and lastly, understanding the difference between a private venture firm and a corporate venture firm. Of course, we're, we're Intel, so we're a big company, so you got to want a lot of love, right? Because you're going to get a whole lot of love <laughs> from Intel. It's a beast. Uh, and so, you know, understanding what's unique about a corporate, you know, do you want a business relationship with a company? Are you looking for go-to-market support? So we've got channels and we've got resources in other regions to get you visibility with your customers. Um, you still are going to be subject to the partner that you choose, so you should also do the research on the individual, but you're going to have a whole lot more help than that, and, and hold them to it, right? I mean, corporates promise a lot of things sometimes, but make sure they deliver on the things that they promise. And one of the things that I love about Intel Capital is that we do require business agreements with the investments that we make. We have some latitude to do what we call eyes and ears deals, which are uh, not strategic sponsored deals, per se, by a business unit, but Many of them are sponsored by a business unit, so there is a collaboration agreement that's established which says this is what you're going to do and this is what we're going to do. Make sure you know you hold us accountable to deliver on those things because we'll definitely hold you accountable to uh, deliver on your part. All right. Um, there's a whole set of topics, but for those of you who want to be in this chair one day, uh, it'd be interesting to hear what your path has been into the VC job. And do you want to start? Sure. Um, I um, first of all, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics um, and a minor in computer science. Um, so I started early investing in software as a track for my career. Um, I worked for a year as a systems programmer at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and quit my job and and started as a software entrepreneur, where I actually did, for better or worse, write some of the code. Um, when my company was acquired um, in Minneapolis, I moved out here to Silicon Valley. And my intention was to continue being an entrepreneur. Uh, but uh, John Hummer um, wanted to start a software firm and uh, stalked me for about a year and a half. And he's tall. And so he's 6'10". He's the tallest venture capitalist, I think. <laughs> I, am. I, I could be the shortest. <laughs> I try to wear. Perhaps. Um, and you know, what, what, so I didn't actually think about being a venture capitalist or what skills or capabilities I needed. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much a product of the software industry and I still think of myself as being in the software industry and I just happen to be a venture capitalist. And would you say that that makes you particularly attractive to entrepreneurs just because you have been in their shoes? How um, big a factor is that? I, you know, I think they're, you know, now I've been in their shoes such a long time ago that they think they're wearing different shoes. <laughs> uh, but they that's are. not true. Well, uh, Birkenstocks or flip flops. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, in the beginning, it was really helpful. Um, and it was, I and it's also good to be able to, they're just on that topic, uh, another 30% of our time is what I'll call general psychodrama. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> You know, our jobs, I mean, we, we hand over the money directly to the entrepreneurs and say, have at it. And, you know, we, you know, we don't know how most of these entrepreneurs scale until they either do scale or don't. One of the big jobs of the board is to hire and fire the CEO. And I'm sure all of us have had to fire CEOs or have help them exit gracefully from the building quickly. Um, <laughs> you know, sometime in our career. So, you know, having been in the shoes of hiring people, uh, hiring a lot of people, and, you know, managing engineers, um, understanding how hard it is to build companies from scratch from the standpoint of a CEO is very helpful. From my standpoint, I also think if you're doing enterprise software, you really have to be able to lift up the hood. Because, you know, the, the business descriptions are usually coming from engineers. Um, you know, then there's business models on top of that. And if you don't really understand what these products are intended to be or actually what the technical shifts in the market are, it's pretty hard to be a core enterprise software investor. So, you know, in our firm, we look for people who have had pretty deep technical skills in software because we're a focused fund. Uh, and it's all the better if they've either succeeded or failed as in, in the leadership role of a company. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Aileen. Sure. Okay. So um, I I w did go to MIT for undergrad, but I was never a kind of working engineer. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, and then I af also went to grad school. I always loved consumer businesses, so I actually worked for the North Face in Odwalla when I was at business school. And then actually I worked for Busy Burt, Bur who's in the audience here at Gap when I graduated um, from uh, business school. And so I was going up like a consumer path. I thought maybe I would be like a VP of marketing or CMO or a COO someday. Um, and I always thought venture capital sounded really cool. I was an analyst at Morgan Stanley, and like, you know, after your second year of these analyst programs, a lot of people do a third job, and like, v venture capital sounded amazing. But the two people, types of people who were applying for jobs as like analysts in venture capital were like, guys who grew up in like Danbury, Connecticut, and they're, you know what I mean? And, and like they went to Dartmouth or Princeton and they played squash and like their dads were super rich. And then, um, or like the gunner guys who went to Wharton and like carried a briefcase to a school and like were wore bow ties. Like I just figure I would never fit into, I don't still, you so still like not way? much has changed. <laughs> um, so I didn't even think about it. And then when I was at Gap, I was kind of w helping to build the online business in 99, and I just kind of got lucky, and I got this job at Kleiner Perkins, um, and I thought I would stay for two or three years and then go into an operating role, because I didn't know that much about Silicon Valley, and I figured it'd be a good place to learn, and I did learn a ton. And so I wound up staying for a long time, and I did take two years to actually go be the founding CEO of one of our portfolio companies. So I ran that and raised $20 million and kind of hired the team, shipped product, built revenue, bought a couple companies, and then went back to Kleiner full time. So I feel like I did my kind of like my stint. very difficult stint in the trenches, um, and that's kind of my background. All right. Um, so I also have an engineering undergraduate degree. Um, I, uh, other than summer internships, like at General Motors and at British Petroleum with literally a thousand engineers and two women. Uh, um, so that was my knowledge. And, uh, no one, fr so uh, I'm first generation Chinese immigrant. My, my father, you know, dentist, all of his brothers doctors. My mom was a nurse. That's what I was supposed to do. I Chinese did, women with dentist parents, that's really yeah, that, the, that's that's the, the, that's the key spec. <laughs> so who, thing who, about that. who did not want to go to medical school? Right? So, so being an engineer was like, that was the next acceptable thing. Anyway, I, I give that only as like, I had no idea what venture capital was or entrepreneurship or anything, right? But working in those companies, I was like, oh, you know, being like the engineer in the CAD, behind the CAD machine, that's okay, but not super exciting. The product managers, they seem to have much cooler jobs. Um, they actually at least have input into like, you know, why we're building what we're building. 
So given that, the eager beaver type A uh, firstborn child that I was, I went back to school and said, okay, well, I, evidently I need to get an MBA uh, in addition to my engineering degree, and so how do I get one of those? So I interviewed for investment banks and consulting firms because it seemed like that would give you a good chance to get into business school. Everything was about sort of like two steps ahead. Um, and then I went to work at Bain, um, and that was a great experience, and then I came out here to Stanford, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a product manager. Back then, I'm giving my age, at Hewlett Packard. That was like my goal in life after graduating from business school. I was a product manager that summer at Silicon Graphics, which was actually a really great time to be there. Um, it was like the Jurassic Park year. It was very cool. <laughs> um, and so from that, though, I got a little bit more of a taste of like, oh, you could actually like work at like maybe not such a big company. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, you know, that was once, it was a billion dollar company by then, but it had been a startup by a bunch of guys who had left places like Sun and Silicon Graphics. And did so your parents lose faith in you every oh, step of the way? every step of the way. Every step of the way. <laughs> my, my parents have never once understood any career decision or job that I've ever had. Yeah. But now they've finally stopped worrying about whether like, I'll be able to support them in their old age. Oh so <laughs> it's okay now. My parents still call me and they're like, do you need money? Are you okay? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. When I started my firm, my yeah, dad was totally. like, I know you've been helping us, but like, now that you're at a startup, <laughs> like, know. don't worry about I it. <laughs> Um, so anyway, sorry, my story's a bit long. So I became a venture capitalist sort of by accident. I was an entrepreneur. So after, after business school, a couple of people that I had gone to Stanford GSB with had started a company and had just raised um, a seed round from DFJ. Um, I actually knew Jennifer. We worked at Bain together before business school. Fast forward five years. We just raised our seed round. I joined. I ran, you know, product, um, marketing, sales, basically everything that required talking to people outside of the building. <laughs> Customer support was fun. Um, and uh, Tim Draper and Jennifer actually were our lead investors, and that was when I reconnected with her. Um, so she was uh, an observer on our board. And that was really how I even understood really what venture capital was, was mm -hmm. by helping to raise like $15 million of venture capital and going through three rounds of funding. And at the end of that, you know, I wanted to go do another startup again. Um, we'd had three CEOs in 12 months, so I thought it was time for me wow. to leave. Mm -hmm. um, I, wasn't, I was young and not so smart, but I was smart enough to figure out that that probably wasn't a good sign for my startup. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I was, it, was, it was late 98, early 99, and um, a couple of the other VCs who were on my board, knowing my background, said, you know, I'll introduce you to three other portfolio companies um, at various stages to see whether you want to do early or later. I'm also going to introduce you to some other VCs who are looking for associates or analysts who, you know, your background seems like it could be interesting. You have experience in the internet. I kid you not. That was what they said. Anyway, turned and so out to be a big deal. Turned out to be a big deal. <laughs> Very big deal. Who knew? This crazy internet e-commerce thing. So, um, and that's how I ended up at Excel. And I joined as an associate, and you know, worked my way up through the ranks, became a partner, and eventually a managing partner, and then started my own firm. All right. Wow, great. Okay, so I'm from Toledo, so my story is not nearly as interesting. <laughs> I grew up in, o in Ohio. Uh, I do have a technic technical degree, so I was a software developer uh, for the first three or four years of my career. I worked in IT at a company in my hometown, Owens Corning. Uh, I got my Bachelor of Science uh, at Penn State and absolutely had no idea what, what venture capital was. It wasn't even a thought back where I was from. So I knew I wanted to do something in business, and I knew I didn't want to sit behind a desk and code for the rest of my career, so I decided that I was going to be a general manager. That was a way for me to get access to what looked like to be the, the moving and shaking in, in the company, right? These are guys that ran P&Ls. So I embarked on a uh, ambitious plan to get my company to sponsor me on a business rotation. So I, I got out of IT and I did sales, I did product marketing, I did strategic planning. It was kind of a mini GM uh, prep course, if you, were, if you will. I did that for about three or four years and then realized I needed to seal the deal with an MBA. So I went to HBS and got my uh, master's in business. And then I looked out over the horizon and I said, Silicon Valley is where I've got to be. Kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to be in Silicon Valley. You know, I, I knew I wanted to be in tech again. And so Intel was a great platform. I had other opportunities uh, with other tech firms that you would know. Uh, but opted to take the Intel offer and 
uh, you know, I've been happy with that. I mean, I, I started as a product marketing engineer and then product marketing manager at Intel. So I was doing technical marketing with our PC OEMs. And it was the desktop business, so it was the cash cow. So a lot of attention there, a lot of resources. And after doing that for about three years, I thought, wow, Intel's a big company. What else can I do? <laughs> because, you know, you're not really putting an MBA together, I mean, to use, right? I'd spend $100,000 on an MBA, and I figured I probably should be using it instead of writing technical papers and talking to IT people uh, and PC uh, people. So I went looking and uh, fortunately found what was then called corporate business development, is now called Intel Capital. And I've been there for 14 years. You know, as I've worked my way up through the ranks, I started off as a, an individual contributor investing. And then I got a, a, a team lead running the e-commerce team. And then I got a sector lead running the enterprise software team. And then I got a managing director lead and was appointed a vice president uh, running all of software and services. So uh, it's been a long haul for me. Didn't think I'd stay at Intel that long, uh, but it's been, it's been a great experience. And I've got to see and do more deals than, than you can imagine. It's been amazing. Those are four different stories, but I think they have a lot in common, right? A lot of sort of in the trenches experience, and then somehow magically you fall into it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know that anybody had a plan to There's be no, a VC, like so no path, I think. which yeah. uh, which is interesting. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, so, Aileen and Teresa, you are um, Aileen. Do you have a do you have a partner at the firm? I do have a team member. Yeah. Okay, man or woman? Guy. Okay, and so you have a female firm. Is is there does is that by design or is that just because you've known Jenna forever and you make good partners? Um, it really was because um, we've known each other for a long time and we we knew that we had the same philosophy about both the type of firm that we wanted to start mm -hmm. in terms of the the market opportunity mm -hmm. that we saw having come from bigger firms like seeing this what we think of as a white space with a big getting bigger right. um, and you know multi-geography, multi-stage, which was not what either of our firms were when we joined in 96 mm -hmm. or 99. Um, but also, so actually we were independently thinking of doing our own thing, going out and doing seed and early stage mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that we loved to do. And as we were talking, truly more networking as we had been over the course of our careers around stuff mm -hmm. like, you know, there aren't that many women managing partners. Um, so talking about stuff like, okay, what's your philosophy on, you know, how to hire people and when to promote people. So we knew we had a lot of commonality mm -hmm. in terms of culturally how we wanted to run our firms. So it gave us a lot of comfort. And we were literally like comparing notes on like stuff, which I did with Aileen as well about like, okay, who should you hire as like your rent a CFO and right. all that other stuff. And at one point she was literally just like, you know, it sounds like we want to do doing the same twice, thing. Why, right? why should we do this, do this together? Yeah. Um, and That's it's been great. wonderful to work together that way. I, I do want to say one thing about the other thing on our commonality, which, you know, because, uh, you know, great. You, you said people aren't going to like do anything to public, so I'm going to be candid. So the one thing you notice, right, is that all four of us, though we have different paths, all four of us have technical undergraduate degrees yes. and some either formal business training and or entrepreneurial background. And I will tell you, the dudes from Danbury don't all have that. <laughs> so, you know, if you look at overall venture capital, you will find a much higher percent. Like, yes, that is the that is the well-grooved path. It's like the more likely than not. But you know, a lot of really successful and prominent male venture capitalists that you would know have no technical degrees, have never worked at entrepreneur. At, but as a woman you will be told that you need to have all those checkmark items. Is it fair? I don't know. Um, but it just is what it is. It's just like, you know, you know, my, my mom told me, he's like, you know, you just have to work twice as hard and be twice as good as everybody else. And just it is the way it is. So anyway. So Anne, have you seen the, are the number of um, female founders that you've been able to invest in? Has that grown at all? Do you see more women entrepreneurs these days than you saw when you first got started? Well, we and you obviously are focused on enterprise software. So. Yeah, we just gave a term sheet to a um, uh, woman co-founder, woman CEO firm last week, mm -hmm. um, and you know she got a lot of attention from you know our partnership because we don't really see that many women in enterprise software. It's it's pretty shocking actually. Um, again, um, if you look at the stats coming um, along, you know the the number of computer science science majors in the U.S. is, is not that large. It's the going down for it's women. It's going down. Yeah. It's going down for women. It was like, you know, 20% and now it's like 13%. 
um, most of the women coming in, uh, and, and actually most of our um, founder, you know, CEO types, there are a good number that do have an MBA. I mean, they, they want that job as a CEO, they've got the advanced degree. Other than Stanford and Harvard, um, which has a higher percentage of um, women as MBAs, only about the typical MBA class in other universities is 20 to 25 percent. So we're dealing with a law of small numbers here for qualified to, you know, to, to the, the enterprise software market is very large now, very competitive. Um, you know, the skill, the bar keeps rising for entry level skill other than your some, you know, wonderkind who, you know, has, thinks of something in their dorm room. Um, so, you know, we were really excited to give her this term sheet. She's super qualified. You know, we won't be announcing that deal for some time. Um, and she just did a fantastic job of, you know, presenting her idea, her concept. Um, and she was very authentic. That's another thing that um, my partners and I really liked about her. She was very open about, you know, what she thought uh, the opportunity was, as well as the challenges. You know, we got to know her really quickly. She she really, really was herself. She wasn't. She was very comfortable in her own skin as a right. woman. She wasn't. She hadn't gone to like prep classes somewhere to be prepared to present to venture capitalists and sort of was acting the role. And the VCs she noticed that and it's really not a good idea. It so doesn't help you at all. You know, but the answer to your question is, um, you know, it's pretty much on change. We gave our first term sheet to um, Heidi Roizen and Tea Makers. So we you. started with a woman, but it hasn't changed much. It's very mm -hmm. disappointing. And did I just hear you say that you think a founder should have an MBA to be able to be grow into the CEO role? You know, I mean, founders are all sorts of um, right. characters, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> which, which is the joy of our job. I mean, we would be called capitalists if there was a handbook here, but we're venture capitalists, which means as, as an adventure, right? Yes, yeah. as, in, as in something, as in venture. Uh, but our CEOs, uh, our best CEOs, um, I'm not talking necessarily about the founder, but ultimately these companies have to have CEOs, and they are frequently not the founder. Because um, in the enterprise software space at Seed and A, mm -hmm. you know, you, you really some frequently have a technical team where you look for someone who's capable of running it for a while, but may not scale to the CEO. But our best CEOs are, are very well trained and educated. Got it. How about you? What, what female deals do you so see? I do think there are a lot more female founder CEOs than there were when I started in 99, especially in the consumer side. Right, in the consumer side. Um, and the enterprise side, I think it's, it's much thinner. And I think for any of you who are working in larger companies right now and you're at like, you know, the director, VP level, you are an awesome candidate to be a founder. Um, I think most of the best founders have good training from existing tech companies that have high growth. And so whether it's you or it's someone you work with, you know, I think my frustration in there not being as much kind of gender balance in tech is, you know, we have like, I think challenges at every stage of the pipeline from who the investors are to what the kind of supply side looks like. And if there aren't great women who are directors and VPs at tech companies, we're not going to increase the number of female CEOs. And so, like, if you see some superstars who don't, like, you don't think they're going to stay in the workforce, like, encourage them, support them to stay in, because we have to keep this pipeline increasing, not decreasing. Otherwise, it's never going to get better. I'll give you an example. I mean, Diane Green, of all fabulous people, yeah. was told by someone, you should do your own company. So. <laughs> That, uh, to me, that's an incredible anecdote. It's not yeah. like she had this plan all along. So if, if you're wondering if you should, you might want to really think about yeah. it. Yeah. Aileen said one other really key thing is that when we you know, are auditioning these companies uh, we, and we, we get attracted to one, we, we look at the founding team and see what movies have they seen before. <laughs> have they only been working at horror shows? <laughs> you know? uh, so you know, this is one thing for your own career as well. If you are in a horror show, leave. Because you want to you know, see how, what a good movie is like. You, right, you know, yeah. Even if you don't have the That's same right. level job you had at the horror it show, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter. Because e every day in you know in entrepreneur land you're learning mm -hmm. and you know you want to know how to how to sort you know what 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 is good learning from bad learning and that's really really important for building companies. 
Yeah, I think we should get some more questions. Kim. Hi, I had a question about all of you had the technical undergraduate degree, but then you all went and got your MBAs. And just following up on the MBA question, did you, looking back, do you feel like that was a good use of time and money? Like, do you feel like you're applying that? And then the second part of it is, I guess, um, would you encourage other women to do the same thing, sort of regardless? Is it having, is it what you learn or having the credential? Or is it it's network, is the, is the network that you I think it's all, three. it's all three, it's all three. Go to the best business school you can get into. If you're gonna go, you should go to the best school that you can get into, because it is the network, it is the credential, and especially in venture, venture is like Stanford, Harvard. You know, most, most of the people that have MBAs uh, do have degrees in, at those two universities. So it is important, in my view, to have that education, especially if you haven't been an entrepreneur or if you haven't worked in functional business areas and, and uh, at a company. Because you, one of the things that's really important about venture is developing judgment. You know, what makes a good company? And a lot of that is just your intuition from experience of talking to lots and lots and lots of companies about what works and what doesn't work. You know, what kind of people do you want? Uh, what sort of track record should they have? You know, what's the business model? How are they monetizing? How are they going to market? You know, what are the product details, right? Is it, is it differentiated? Is it a sustained differentiation? And those are just terms you don't really know until you, you get the MBA, in my view. I will. Uh, I as, as, in addition to the whole, the financial assess assessment, financial statements, IRR analysis, those are some of the things you have to do and you kind of do need to have that education to be effective at it, I think. I'll, I'll say though, I mean, I think there's no, there's no harm in getting an MBA, but I will say like Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, Mark Zuckerberg, the list goes on and on of all people who had the thing that trumps all the other stuff, which is product genius. Totally. So I think there's so many people who are fantastically successful and there, there are people in our shop who are great venture capitalists who do not have the MBA. So I, I don't think that it's something that you need to put on your list as like cannot move along unless it would be I would my agree. Yeah, I also, I think so. Yeah, so, that. yeah, yeah no, so I, I would totally agree on, on, on the entrepreneurial side. I think it's much more, you know, probably far fewer that do have right, it, it's not a requirement. On the venture side, I agree with you, and this was a little bit of my point before, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think you could right. develop, you can develop business and product instincts by seeing lots of things, by being a successful entrepreneur, or being in a company that's not a horror show like Ann said. But I will, and this is the part that's not PC, but I, I will say, you know, most people enter the venture capital business in, well, in one of two ways, right? It's like all of us, you enter sort of, you know, at earlier in your career, Earning and when it. you're when or or later after you've been a super successful mm -hmm. CEO like JJ, right? A, as as a partner, um, frankly, very far fewer women do it that way. Right. Um, and if you're going to come in through the front door, so to speak, as I'm going to keep using it because I thought it was funny, as Aileen said, where you're going to be sort of walking up against the guys with the bow ties or who's <laughs> from you know whatever Danbury. Um, unfortunately, when because I look. I, I, I led recruiting internally, uh, not as a function, but in terms of like leading to help build the team because by the time I left Excel, when I came, there was like four or five of us and there are probably a dozen investment professionals just in the Palo Alto office, let alone elsewhere. And, and I don't think it was explicit, but I saw when people looked at resumes for potential associates, you know, if you didn't have a technical degree, if you didn't have an MBA, and you were a woman, I, I had a really hard time getting Selling. other people to take those interviews. And you could do that with yeah. the equivalent men. Yes. As long as, totally. if it's yeah. Bob or uh -huh. totally. Peter. Yeah, but in reality, I, I think what you're saying is that the, the, there's two ways that people typically get into the venture industry. It's sort of you're already in the inner circle, meaning that it's an entrepreneur that uh, you'd like to move into the venture community. You know half of our partners were CEOs of our companies before and we convinced them that they should stop being CEOs and become an investor. The reason for that is that it's all in all, even the largest firms are a small number of people. So fit is really, really, really key. If you don't sort of fit into this tiny little group of people that you have to see every day, first of all, your life would be hell and you know it just doesn't work because stuff goes 
really right sometimes the stuff goes really wrong and everybody has to sort of be able to do kumbaya together in some sort of form <laughs> the other way is really through the associate path and most of the associates are recruited for summers out of MBA uh, classes mostly Stanford and Harvard and, and Stanford and Harvard do a good job in presenting those candidates even if you're not looking for them <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes uh, Wharton and then you sun suddenly get a superstar summer associate that you're tracking and bring along into your firm. So it, it's, it's it, you know, occasionally recruiters are used just to scout, uh, n more than occasionally, there's scouting done mm -hmm. to say, are we looking at the best candidates for openings in our firms? But for m the most part, it's through, you know, inside baseball, you're already in the portfolio company or you're coming in, uh, you know, at the entry level from an MBA group. Go ahead. So, um, Trish Costello, uh, the portfolio. So, you know, I know 50, 20 years ago there were 3% women VC, it moved up to maybe 12, and now they say 4.2%, I think, Dan Primack. But I've seen so many of you now that have been here 15 years. Um, in 20 years in different funds, and you're actually leaving those large funds and creating your own smaller funds, and Adele Oliva and Tracy Warren, and there's so many of you. What's the difference between, which, which I think is really exciting, but what's the difference as you look at it between the power and influence you had as one person in a Kleiner or an Excel versus the kind of power influence that you have to make an impact as uh, you know, a founder in your own smaller funds? I mean, so I take a lot of inspiration from my entrepreneurs, and I'll, I'll use that as an analogy, right? So, and many of you are, uh, some of you are entrepreneurs, some of you are ex executives at larger companies, right? So you can be an executive at a larger company, and it's not that it's a, it's not that it's a bad place, or you know, it can be a great place, but the amount of change and the speed at which you can make change because of the N number um, is just much slower and much different and the amount of impact you can have. And so when you're a founder, um, you know, it's your vision. It's, you know, you get to start from sort of the, you know, from blank sheet of paper. Um, so I think it's, I think that's the difference. That, that was kind of what, what kind of drove me. It was sort of, I had an entrepreneur who told me once when it was sort of like, had sort of done it like three or four times. It's sort of like, why, why are you doing this again, right? And it was sort of like, I just feel like I'm called to this. It's like I really see something that I want to do. And I can't, you know, where I am is a great place, but I can't do that here. It just doesn't fit. So the only way I can do that is to go out there and do it myself. And also fundamentally, like, um, I think a lot of entrep great entrepreneurs are, are kind of impatient. And for any of you who know me, I'm yep. extremely impatient. And so you can move a lot faster yep. when you're just kind of a much smaller group. Yep. I would totally echo what Teresa said. I think, um, obviously, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't think it was better. <laughs> um, and it's, it's like, now I'm two years into it, it's way better. Um, and it's, I was also inspired by some entrepreneur friends. I was having dinner with some friends, and this was probably three years ago, um, who are entrepreneurs, and they were asking me about changes going on at Kleiner and things like that, and we were kind of talking a little bit about what was going on. They were like, when are you going to leave to start your own firm? And honestly, it, had, it, wasn't not, if, it, was it had not crossed my mind to be honest, like, you know, Kleiner's super socially respectable, it's a big platform, we had great deal flow, like, I think, in my mind, I had been thinking, like, I think I'm an intelligent person, I think I have a lot to bring to the table, but a lot of people want to talk to me because I'm a Kleiner partner, maybe not necessarily because I'm me. And I think I could do a good job even if I was just me. And so it was that dinner that really inspired me. Like, I could do that. Why wouldn't I but do isn't that? it amazing? I hear that so often yeah. that women are sort of asked to go yeah. do it. I and wish I had we it somehow myself. seem to be waiting for someone to tell us that we should go do it. Yeah. So go do it. <laughs> Whatever it is that you want yeah, to do. do um, well, anyhow, uh, what about you, Margit? I mean, you, you were running a, you know, a top yes. uh, marketing firm and uh, seemed like, you know, you know, leading a, another sector. How, how was the transition out of one industry? I'm, I'm changing, I'm being the moderator right now. <laughs> how was the transition from a totally different industry where you worked with a lot of entrepreneurial companies into, right. into the venture I, world? I would say when I first moved to this country, I worked at an agency that was chock full of women. It was run by men, and that really was annoying to me <laughs> because that m my the home industry is like chock full of women and that was just weird. So it was really fun to start my own because you can put your the 
the imprint of the values that you have and the culture and, and what you want to make that's bigger than just what you do every day. And there's nothing more gratifying than that. And I have a child and I have the, the outcast agency and that, that is my other child still. And um, if, you, if you think that you might like that, you will love it. That, that is absolutely amazing. The reason that I made this weird decision to come here, because I don't like being an employee, like I, I, I there was not, um, that part was not attractive. But um, I thought at the time, maybe that was naive, but I thought that the list of top five firms was very, very established and it was almost, that it was going to be very tricky to become one of those. And I didn't know that I could do that, and that, that was the job, at least the, the spec that I was asked to do. And then I liked, um, I liked the values of the founders and the, the way they had set it up, and I liked the fact that it, it was a partnership, but it, it had like normal hierarchies because some of that stuff gets dysfunctional. But fundamentally, I did it because I knew how to run Outcast, and I didn't know that I could do this. And like this kind of job doesn't come around every other day, right? So that that was the reason and I did it. An amazing job. An amazing job. I have a lot to work with. Um, and I will also say uh, thank you, but we have a lot to prove because we're like not even five years old. So you know, you guys all have delivered a lot more results than we have so far, but hopefully we'll change that. On, on that point though, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of research on this and women generally prefer not to get out of the comfort zone. So you don't see uh, a lot of women, and I think some venture firms have been trying to find women partners and they want these product specialists, people that have been running businesses and, you know, have technical acumen and, and to get them to move out of that role into a venture investing role, no matter how difficult. sexy it is and how exciting it sounds and how much you read about it, it's a real leap. You know, we, we like to be overqualified for the position. So to go from, you know, I'm an expert in this to I know absolutely nothing about that is a, is a leap for us. But we need to leap more. We do. I think we need to leap Can more. Can I add something to that too? Because um, I think that's an important point about like maybe the MO of women wanting to be overqualified. And I think that women also project that on other women. I and agree. If you're a woman, you're putting forth a female candidate for in any job. Um, you want to make you want to cross more T's and dot more I's than uh, if it's someone else, and that that is something that we do to ourselves. That's absolutely shitty. We should stop. Yeah, the research supports that guys who, uh, have 20 percent of the qualifications qualifications for a job think that they're overqualified. If we have 80 percent of the qualifications, we're still not sure if we can do it. So I mean, the research supports that. So I mean, it, it is something we have to overcome, and I think we do it in community. So I have a quick question. Um, I think, I mean, you brought up a great point about culture. <clears throat> so I'm Kristen Gill from Google. And I'd just love to hear, particularly from the two of you, about what elements do you think the culture that you will cultivate for your firms that you really want to make different from where you came from? You start. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that uh, a few things. So one is that we were very focused on kind of going back to our roots and just focus, just, and I use that word, stop talking like that, and focusing on what we felt was both the most personally fun and fulfilling part of the venture capital business, but also actually historically over time is the most lucrative part of the venture capital business, which is the Series A and seed investing. And not, and, and, and being very focused on that and being non-apologetic about that. Um, there are many other amazing firms, and I think the business is, you know, has evolved a lot in the last 15 years. And in order to be at a certain level, you need to have a much larger platform. Um, but we were lucky enough to be at a place in our careers where we could just, and just, we could focus on the things that we personally found most fulfilling and exciting. And that was doing the companies like the Trulias or the Impervas or the Athena Health, where we're literally like, incubating the guys in our office, helping them write their business plan, taking them to their first enterprise customer pitches in the case of Imperva. Um, and so that sort of, and I, I start with that because first and foremost, it really is all about the entrepreneurs and the companies that we work with. That defines everything. Uh, and we want to continue to grow the firm over time, as Aileen has, and she'll talk about what she's been doing, because she's, <laughs> she's ahead of me so as much. always. I don't know where we're going um, so much. But we want, 
to bring people on board, and people have asked us, only women? No, of course not, uh -huh. men and women. The most, <laughs> the most qualified entrepreneurs and or uh, later aspect team members. But we want people who really feel like that's what they want to do, that. And I think that, for example, you know, Fred Wilson and Brad at Union Square Ventures in New York have done an excellent job, you know, unapologetically just, d just focusing on the areas that they said that they wanted to do. And I know they have tons of opportunity to do more and grow faster and raise more capital. So I think that the starting the culture is actually the easy part, remaining disciplined and focused on it and living it and making sure that with every hire and every investment, you're actually adding to that core mission and not pulling yourself away from it. Because the last thing I'll just tie it back to when we were talking before about deal flow, deal flow absolutely is the life lifeblood of our business. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I agree with Aileen. I think there's hot deals of the day, both at the early stage and at the later stage. And look, if the hot deal of the day happens to be someone that has a prior relationship or connection or we, we have a unique in, of course, Jennifer and I would love to do that. But we don't want to be in a place where you spend your whole time sitting here, and I'm going to make fun a little bit because I never really understood being on Sand Hill Road, never having been here. It's like looking out the windows and seeing who's walking between the different <laughs> offices. I never really understood that mentality. Um, so being much more proactive, which I think is aligned with what Anne and mm -hmm. Aileen uh, and Lisa said, which is thinking about what are the types of companies, markets, entrepreneurs, areas where we are excited and we're going to proactively try to I expand our deal flow in that area as opposed to, you know, what I'll call chasing your tail and looking around at like what's hot today. Yeah. Um, so Cowboy Ventures is pretty small. It's just myself and another person. And I don't actually know if it's ever going to get very big. Like I like, I came from a place that started small and got very big. And I didn't really like it as much when it got really big. So I, you know, Cowboy Ventures is very personal. It's like, and we're goofy and we're silly. And like when, like we have this new ritual when like when our portfolio companies have raised enough money to open like a, their first office, we send them a disco ball. <laughs> like if that's like, look, we're like goofy. We're like, we're, I can be myself now. You know, whereas before I kind of feel like I was my sanitized self. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's a very personal business. It may never be more than three or four people. Um, but I think it will always be like very hands-on and personal. I think one of the things that Teresa and I are super excited about is like we've been friends basically since I started, and we've never been able to co-invest because we, when you're a Series A or Series B investor, you want as, from our firms, you want as much ownership as possible. So we could talk about deals, and we could never figure out how to split them. And now we can work well, together actually, all the time. Actually, we could. We just yeah, couldn't our partners, always convince our other people who are less collaborative. It. Yeah, and Maybe so it's true. Right. And no, it's seed, true. yeah, and seed is very collaborative. Like, I don't want to be the only institutional seed investor. I want to do it with Teresa and Jennifer or like other people. So that's a great thing that I love about what I'm doing now. Yeah, one, th one challenge about the culture of venture capital firms in is that they're groups of large personalities. And it's really, e <laughs> <laughs> yeah. none of us are part of that group. But um, you know, I I when you think about what we do, I mean, we have to be out there talking to the entrepreneurs. We have to have a point of view to the rest of the industries we're investing in. We have to, you know, sit on these on boards. You know, some of the board decisions are not always pleasant. So we have to be, you know, very definitive and sometimes uh, not agree with uh, our founders and CEOs. So when your firm is small, it's somehow you, you can make all the big personalities get along. And venture firms are democracies. There's, there's not like, you know, we have voting day and everybody gets the same equal vote. It's who has the big personality that day that can mm -hmm. deep six or support something. And that, so, <laughs> you know, the bigger and bigger the firms get, you know, the harder it is to sort of um, get everybody on the same page. And so people's personalities get bigger, not smaller. <laughs> and so it's, it, but it is the nature of why the industry doesn't scale that much. Because it's really hard to hold these firms together. Uh, there are cycles of fundraising. So sometimes you can raise larger funds and have more people or smaller funds and have less people. So it's actually pretty amazing that the whole thing even holds together as an industry at, at <laughs> all. I'm sure we'll all agree. Yes. I We've got I time for two more questions. I think, yeah, we're yeah. coming to the end. Two so questions. Go ahead. The people have mics. Oh, you have a mic. Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, Sabina Clark from SAP Ventures. I am in the market development group there <laughs> as a consultant, I'll note. Um, and the reason I note that is because um, 
where we are today, uh, Margaret, in, in fact, in her role, has done a brilliant job messaging the innovation that this firm has brought to venture capital. And a big piece of that innovation has been this idea of value add for the portfolio companies. So I'd appreciate hearing just to that point too of the scale of venture capital firms and the ability to have these roles, where you see that going and continuing, if you see that continuing and what that trajectory may look like. Yeah, Intel Capital has kind of been in that business for a while. We, uh, we didn't do nearly as good a job as marketing it as, <laughs> as market. But we, you know, we have a large uh, operational organization that supports the companies we invest in. Uh, we've got business development, we've got PR, we've got marketing, we've got events that we manage, technology days where we bring in uh, our business development accounts, Intel business development accounts, to preview our portfolio CEO. So they get to make a pitch to the C-level decision makers at a lot of Fortune and companies that they wouldn't normally be able to access. So we bring a lot to the table, and I talked earlier about go-to-market and you know channel support and you know, technology enabling. So there's a lot that we bring to the table um, for the companies that we invest in, and that's a part of our differentiation. We really do focus on that. I don't see that going away at all. I see you know private firms doing more of it, being more visible. Uh, you know, maybe not with the scale that we have, just because we're 102,000 employees, but uh, but still trying to add value. I see that the larger firms, I mean, clearly, um, it's not only that Mark's done a great job, which she has, of, of messaging that, but I think that um, these guys have done a very good job of building a new and different model. And I think that at the larger end, because you have to be a pretty substantial firm in terms of overall scale, assets under management, and people in order to provide those services. So I do see and I hear, I know, that it's definitely making all the other big guys take notice. And I think in various different ways um, uh, the industry is moving in that direction and as you know now being at a small place um, you know I think that to, to Aileen's point on collaboration I think we now are both at firms um, as and and always has been as well in a, a more focused place where we can now partner uh, even at the series A stage because it's a whole lot easier to think about us doing two or three million as opposed to two giant firms we each want to put 10 million into the Series A, which is only 10 million. Um, and so from that standpoint, selfishly, I hope to leverage uh, these resources mm -hmm. for my companies at bigger places. And that what I provide and what Aileen provides is I'm the one who provides the hands-on help to the companies to the things that they want to do. So, you know, I have I have edited launch plans, I have edited mm -hmm. PR releases, I've made cold calls for my companies into uh, press when they want to launch products or, or whatever, right? So I get that and that doesn't scale to a much larger extent, but I actually love doing that part and then I hope to partner with the bigger firms who can provide more leverage resources when the companies grow to a size that they can actually take advantage of it. And we're actually doing a lot less seed investing because there are fabulous people like you guys out there. Thank so you, we appreciate that. No, seriously. <laughs> so we, um, you know, competition. <laughs> we're doing we're doing a lot less of that because we figure there are a lot of people who cover this and and that's where you know you're so early stage there's, there's no point in like having 100 people trying to help you right and later hopefully we come into play so we're gonna get the last question uh, and then we'll wrap up we can ask some questions afterward but I want to make sure we get out on time so one more question yes hi my name is Karen Vasudhavan and um, I'm a vice president at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management I I really want to commend you on your leadership and impressiveness working in a male-dominated industry. And I'd love for you in closing to share, if you would, your own unique way, um, you know, share with us some secrets as to how you kicked ass in, in each of your space. <laughs> and you, you've kicked more ass than all of us, so why don't you go? Thanks a lot, Lisa. You know, it's it's. Uh, I, I thought it would be easier to kick ass if you're tall like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, size does not matter apparently. You know the. Uh, um, you know, one of the real early pioneers in the in the tech industry is a woman named Sandy Kritzik, and she did an interview recently. And people always ask us, us this question, and she said, you know, something very clearly. She goes, "Look, I've always been comfortable being a woman. I've never tried to act like the guys." Um, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota. My dad was the head basketball coach, so I can say that I was in the locker room at age three. <laughs> um, 
my mother was unhappy with that, but my dad was in charge of me as the oldest. So I, I think you really just, the, the way you kick ass is just be comfortable with your own ass. Um. <laughs> Yeah. Quote of the day, for sure. <laughs> Somebody could tweet that. That would be a good tweet. <laughs> That's too bad. That's too bad. I don't know if I, I have no more to add than it. Yeah. <laughs> That's just really the best. The best. Oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. What a wonderful uh, time. Thanks to the panelists, Margaret and Andresa. Uh, we're all done. Enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>